All right, well, um, thanks for bearing with me, everyone, and uh, welcome to the September 2021 Open uh, Events Leadership Meeting. Um, let's get started. Uh, let me check and see if anybody else added anything to the agenda. Um, I uh, was just going to talk about the Developer Summit. Uh, more through, all right. So, um, yeah, the OpenZFS Developer Summit, we posted the schedule. Um, I will share my screen. So you can see um, the talks that we've selected, we have uh, eight great talks from community members. Um, and if you want to see more about the talks, you can click through here. And then uh, these are the text that people submitted about the talks. Um, so the conference will be November 8th to 9th. You can register now. Uh, the format will be pretty much similar to last year in terms of um, you'll need to register uh, for registration is free, but you'll need to register to get access to the Zoom um, to post questions and answers. Um, otherwise, you can join on, on YouTube. We'll be streaming it live on YouTube. Um, cool. So thanks to everybody who submitted talks. I think it's going to have a great lineup this year. Uh, and I'm, I'm excited for it. Uh, any questions about the Developer Summit? We'll have a hackathon the second day. Um, uh, I'd love to see some of the folks here uh, step up and like lead some hackathon sessions. Um, one of the requests that we got after last year was to try to organize the hackathon a little better, uh, meaning to like direct newcomers a little bit more as to what to do and, and how to participate. So um, I think we had maybe one um, group that was kind of set up that way last year, but it would be great if we had more people that wanted to help newcomers and get help from newcomers um, with their projects. So we can try to set that up beforehand. Questions about OpenZFS Developer Summit? Great. Um, the other topic that I saw on the agenda, oh, great, more topics. Um, speeding up ZFS lists, ready for review. Uh, was that Alan, do you want to say? Yeah, words about that? Uh, so this is an expansion of some work uh, Powell Doedek did for FreeBSD like five or more years ago, uh, where if you're doing a ZFS list of, uh, and you only ask for fields like the name and the GUID, that don't require actually uh, opening the, the data set itself, um, then you can do the list a lot faster because you don't have to actually go and read all the object data. So there's uh, a certain limited amount of metadata that you have about the data set that you can get quickly without having to actually go and open the whole object set. Uh, and that was already there, but I expanded it to incorporate some of the other fields that are readable that way including the, the new one, the create transaction group. Uh, so what transaction group this data set was created at. And so if you list and sort only by that subset of fields, uh, then it the list returns a lot faster because you don't have to go through and actually you know, open every one of the snapshots if you have you know, a thousand snapshots or something. Uh, and so the speed up we saw was something like 300 to 400% on something like 20,000 snapshots across, or 2,000 snapshots each on 10 data sets, or uh, the same thing for, you know, the same number of snapshots spread across different ratios of snapshots to data sets. And Alan, what is the, the, the sort of range of, you said the name, good, TXG? Right, so it's um, name, GUID, create transaction group, the number of clones, whether it's inconsistent, if it's redacted, and the origin. Uh, okay. You can all get from the, like the fizz T instead of having to actually open the object set and, and read the zap of properties. Okay, and then that there is 
you know, there's enough use cases around just wanting that information that it makes sense to, to do this work. It's not like it's going to be rare that someone would just want that information. It seems, I mean, it seems like it's reasonable, but I was just curious. Yeah. So uh, the reason I did the extra work was Pavel's version was mostly you could get the name in the GUID. Right. And so if you did ZFS list dash O name dash S name, uh, you could get all the snapshots sorted by name. But right. that might not be in the order you actually want them in because you need them in uh, chronological order to be able to do things like replication. Right. Uh, and the creation time is only in the zap, but the create TXG is available without having ah, to read the zap. Oh, clever. And so now if you can sort by the create transaction group, you can get them in chronological order quickly, which means the script that you know compares the list of snapshots on two different machines to decide what to replicate can now get that three to 400% speed up, okay. especially on cases where you have a long tail of snapshots. Right, okay. that makes that, that's, that makes sense as a use case, yeah, All right. So is this essentially, it's loading the DSL data set T, but then not going to the object set T? I think, uh, I wrote this a while ago, but I refreshed it recently. Um, Sounds like it. Yeah, so when, it, when you call um, the IOCTO to get the stats. Um, there should be like a, a bunch of stuff in the data set T that we could provide like space, you know, not everything, but a bunch of space accounting information and things like that. Possibly, I'm trying to find it in the diff here. But yeah, there's a, <clears throat> a version uh, to get the stats called underscore fast that only doesn't open as much and it's much faster. Uh, and I just changed the kind of subset of cases where you could use that and it made it broader. I think I got everything that was easily available, but there might be more stats so that you can get. Because uh, I think, like by default, when you're looking at bookmarks, it looks at the logically referenced or something. And if we can get that quickly, then that uh, means more things can be fast. Uh, and there's some places in this where, uh, for example, if we can get some of that um, uh, space accounting stuff faster, we could make uh, ZFS destroy with dash V for a range of snapshots much faster because uh, right now it's doing a lot of math. Um, it's a separate issue I'd like to look at maybe is breaking up, uh, listing the snapshots that you're going to delete from listing how much space that will actually free because calculating the space makes it take a really long time. When you have you know 10,000 snapshots you're trying to delete because somebody forgot to make a rotation policy. Um, and if you do dash V to see the list, it also calculates how much space that will take. And that means it takes a long time. And sometimes you want, you know, I want to, I want that dash V to see the list of what this would do because I'm using no op flag or whatever, but I don't actually want the, the space calculation done. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like maybe it's using DSL data set fast stat. Yes. Internally. Yeah, okay. that sounds that sounds good. Yeah. Funny. So uh it's deciding when it can uh broadening the cases where you can use DSL data set fast stat instead of the full DSL data set stat. All right. Sounds good. Uh sounds like we should review that and get it in. Well, it looks like there's uh, one more thing was added about ZFS allow raw sends only. Yeah, so this one is a question that came into our podcast last week. Uh, someone was setting up automated backups with ZFS send, and uh, you know they've created an unprivileged user that could do the sends of their data sets, but they want to only allow them to send the encrypted version so that they can't see the, the plain text version of the files. But currently, the allow system only allows send or not send. You can't say send, but only raw sends. Hmm. Uh, and so that means anyone who can do a replication can get the, the plain text version that maybe, you know, for the use case of, I want to back up to a remote system or I want a remote system to come to my system and pull a backup. Uh, I want to only allow it to get a raw version that, that doesn't actually give them the plain text. Yeah, that, um... That might be a little tricky. Yeah. I, I get the use case where it's like you want somebody 
you want essentially somebody who's kind of like a sysadmin, but not, uh, you know, you want them to be able to do it not up, easily. Not yeah, kind of use privileges model. Yeah. 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 Um, the tricky thing is that like the raw send, even like the raw send command is, you can do a raw send on a non-encrypted data set and then mm, you get, yes. you know, just like the compressed version of it. Um, mm -hmm. So it wasn't really designed with security from like the person on the command line mm -hmm. in mind. Um, so you need to have like a, a, a few different checks there. Um, I'm sure it's doable though. You know, it, I it guess if like, the data set's not encrypted, then you know, getting it raw is still something. But yeah, uh, it came up, and I actually was thinking that might be an interesting project that's bounded enough to be able to do at the hackathon. Although if it's yeah. too yeah, complicated, maybe. it might not be. But I, I would describe it as I think that what you want is not raw send only, but rather encrypted send, send only. only. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, making that extra distinction there makes sense. Um, other questions about that? All right, then let's open the floor for any unscheduled uh, questions, comments, topics. Yes. <clears throat> I have some several questions about um, ZFS tests configuration environment. On the Linux and probably FreeBSD, you are using not a ZFS root and using uh, ZFS as a model, what you can load and unload and use, use it by ZFS tests on the local created files and provided um, by device. And the deals we, are, we have external provided drives to VM uh, as a full emulated, how we can work with physical drives. We try to test on the different virtualization such as VMware, KVM, Behave. And uh, we have found interest issues um, where we try to create the talk label with slices. Uh, for example, for ZFS create, the pool create tests uh, where we can create ZFS and the slice. After that, if we try to create a label where we can use vault um, disk, uh, we have found some unknown issues um, where uh, unknown errors, where some tests not pass again uh, with the uh, next circle. In ZFS tests, uh, you try to use only one circle and the uh, automation system. But if you try to rerun your tests on the same devices, uh, next try or several tries, you can see some tests have a different results. We try to use it for stability testing and right now, uh, I try to find out what the issue uh, we have with uh, drives, what we are using for the ZFS tests as a physical devices, not by clean files as devices for one circle of tests. It's uh, magic probably for stability where we try to run ZFS tests in loop, but some tests fail it with unknown reason. 
I have no answer for now, but uh, try to find what the issue. Uh, I have ported all ZFS features to DOS from OpenZFS. Mm, and right now we can create a pool under Linux and import to DOS and put it back without issues. Uh, but some ZFS properties, mm, hidden properties should be <laughs> updated for more cons consistency. And um, what the question now? Uh, what is a uh, reason try to use a local drives, local files, and provided by devices for ZFS test instead of provide uh, drives to VM as emulated physical device? Um, let me make sure I understand your question. You're saying um, you're what you have a problem where when you run the ZFS test suite, the first time it runs okay, but then the second time uh, it doesn't run, it, it fails, and it sounds like the problem is related to the physical disks on the machine having been already labeled. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I I I try to explain uh, some unknown issues on my site where we can see some tests fail under the same drives what uh, have been provided to VM. But if we clean up it before the first tests, um, many tests pass, but with next uh, try to run the same list of tests, several tests can be failed if we are using not clean drives. Got it. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, I'm not sure what's up with that. Um, the, uh, I mean, sounds like there's some cleanup that needs to be done to get it back to the original state. That's not happening. Um, seems like something that we could probably investigate and fix. Um, and, and then you, you you're, Kind of had a bigger question about why do we use why do we use those disks rather than creating files on um, on the root disk? Is that right? And using those files as as VDEVs. Uh, yes, I try to find answer or question about uh, probably for better testing will be much more better try to use uh, the same drives for every ZFS test where we can try emulate works with a physical devices. For example, you can get one drive from one system and put it to another system. And it is the same physical device. If we create every time clean files and provide it, is, uh, it uh, by devices, we do not know that uh, we are using the same physical device for tests. Yeah, um, I think that, well, there are a bunch of cases where we do use um, uh, file VDEVs uh, mm -hmm. where, you know, like the configuration doesn't match, you know, you need a bunch of disks to test RAID Z or whatever, it'll use file VDEVs. Um, I'll, I'll ask John Kennedy to weigh in since I know he originally wrote a bunch of that, but my guess is that um, we wanted to test the actual um, disk VDEV type um, rather than the file VDEV type. Although, I mean, I'm sure you could argue that there's a lot of tests that don't really care about the VDEV type that's underneath it. And should those be using the raw disks versus using, you know, file-based pools? I don't know. I think you could probably argue either way. Um, <laughs> But John, yeah. what, what were your thoughts on that? The, the CI CD app for OpenZFS actually uses uh, file-based loopback devices. Um, but at Delphix, we use uh, disks that have been provisioned to the VM. Um, we, uh -huh. In our automation, we don't have anything that uh, 
uses the same disks for more than one test run in a row, but I know that uh, from time to time I do that manually and I haven't seen what uh, you're describing, Igor. I, I wonder if um, probably the best thing to do would be to, to raise an issue sort of describing what new failures you see, what the errors uh -huh. are and that sort of thing, so we can investigate it. Okay, I try to find the steps for reproduce this issue with, and try to minimize a list of tests what can uh, impact of physical devices for next testing. Where I have found uh, corresponding tests, I will try to describe it on issue and uh, will ask for reproduce on next environment. We try to get okay thanks John. And uh, is this also uh, some another question about um, configuration of ZFS tests. Um, on Divas we are using temporary files and the ZFS and for some reason uh, for some tests, we uh, try to change um, global variables for next tests. And if you have a root file system where you try to create a local files for next tests, they can be impacts the FS itself because uh, uh, for example if you try to use corruption of file where we try to create a pool and did not remove it before next iteration your test will be failed because it it corrupts by tests, but did not remove after tests. Yeah, there's a lot of tests that um, I think don't properly clean up the state back to how they were before. Yes, yes. And we try to find what tests should uh, remove artifacts after tests. What we are creating for testing only, because it is the next iteration. If we have previous data, some tests fail it with all the data. Yeah, I think that um, it, for the most part, uh, what I've observed is that the cleanup stuff works right when the tests pass. <laughs> and, um, it, it, but then when the tests fail, then there's a lot of, then, you know, a lot of them do have code to, that's supposed to clean up even when they fail, but there's some where that is not complete. Um, yeah, John, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Mark. Well, I, I just also want to inject that, you know, it's been my experience that, you know, I think the testing, ZFS test infrastructure in general has atrophied a little bit with respect to sort of live drive uh, test machine type test environments because uh -huh. almost all of it's run now in VMs and where things you, know, you can clean up by just simply throwing away the VMs and, and throwing and putting a new one up. And so and I think there's been a lot less effort to make sure yeah. everything gets cleaned up properly these days. Uh, uh, but uh, ZFS tests um, are using uh, one iteration. If you try to run ZFS tests in loop for several iterations, you can find uh, different tests can be failed. Uh, I think uh, design of the first tests was only for one iteration, but for stability, we'll be much more interested to try to run the first tests for a long time, for 10 iterations or many other iteration, iterations. And uh, I think we have to clean up of some issues for run it in a long time. Absolutely. Go for it. <laughs> uh, after, after some um, fixes, uh, I will try to upstream of our 
findings and uh, we try to complete of merges with open zfs but it is a slow process on different platform just for clarity is this the z test or the zfs like functional tests functional i think okay. well, I've, I've used the wrapper script in the scripts directory to run multiple iterations although i think that was mostly of a small subset of the tests, not all of them. No, no, no. But I've definitely oh, said, you know, use that script oh. and tell it to, to run 10 iterations or whatever. Uh, we can run ZFS tests in several iterations. OK. Uh, runner have been fixed for this, for minus i uh, option. But uh, you completely have a summarize of all tests of all iterations, not only for every iteration. That's all on my side. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, Igor. Um, it looked like there was one more uh, bonus content. Special discussion. bonus content. Hey, hey Matt. Um, hey, hey Adam, good to see you. you. It's been a while. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I'm at Oxide here with Josh, and uh, Josh may have more to say on this subject, but we um, bumped into Josh's former colleague, Alex, had hit this issue in Illumos with some data corruption in um, with uh, encrypted ZFS in Illumos. Um, and then we, we started stumbling into a bunch of issues related to it in GitHub that were of the form, yeah, I posted an example there, of the form like someone hit a panic, uh, often data corruption, maybe they followed up, no additional follow-up, stale bot closes. And I don't know, I mean, that seemed discouraging, especially like if someone had gone to the trouble of doing, you know, making a bug report. Um, and in this particular case, it seems like there's still some outstanding data corruption. So I think that, you know, we're, we're looking at the, at this particular data corruption issue because we've, we've gotten interested in it. But my, my, my meta question is about Stalebot and, um, you know, how, how I understand the need to, to kind of keep issues under some manageable content, but if their stuff's being filed and never looked at, if that's the, like, if, if that's how, um, you know, OpenZFS is managing bugs right now. Um. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to share my thoughts on that. I don't know. Uh, I did not set up the Stalebot. Um, so uh, maybe I, I'm not sure if, if folks this who is did is like on here. So uh, I'll just say, like, I'll give my thoughts. And then if somebody wants to, like, correct me or share kind of more of the backstory there, I'd love to hear that as well. Um, I mean, uh, it sounds like uh, there's kind of two problems that you're talking about. One is, um, like there's issues filed that seem important, but like seems like nobody's really looked at them. And the other is um, then the issue is moved from open state to closed state uh, uh, automatically. Um, it seems like, in my opinion, the former problem is much more <laughs> acute. Um, but I but like the closing the bug seems like maybe it's sending the wrong message or maybe it's sending the right message. Um, or maybe saying an accurate message, which is like not a good one. Um, where did you uh, did you have did you run into problems because it was in the closed state, or is it just or was it more like you ran into you you found the bug, but then you saw that it was closed, and then like it felt like the like the project didn't care about it because it was closed. Yeah, I guess I guess you're right that there are two problems. The the like there's there's issues that people file and they. Like apparently nobody looks at them, and I and and um, and then the like stale bot closing it out. And I guess the problem, you know, to your specific question, was the fact that it was closed additionally problematic, or was it merely concerning? Uh, I think maybe both. I think maybe both in that, um, you know, like I think we gravitated more towards open issues than to closed ones. But that may also just be like um, pilot error in that, you know, 
you knowing that there there are potentially things in the closed state that have not been attended to, but merely are stale. Maybe that's like a sufficient you know data yeah. point to to point people in the right direction for like don't just scoop through open issues, but also scoop through closed issues because they may be indistinguishable modulo, you know, some amount of time. Attention. Yeah. 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 So it, and also to be clear, Matt, just just responding to one thing you said, I'm uh, this is not to like accuse or to suggest that setting up stalebot was inappropriate or anything, but more to ask the, to, the disposition and to see if it's concerning. And it sounds like on its face, at least you, you share the concerns that, that we do. Yeah, I mean, my my biggest concern is like that there's issues that are not being addressed. Exactly. Uh, I, I, like in terms of stalebot specifically, like in, in my opinion, I think that it's valuable for the project to be uh, to be forthright about like where resources are being spent, and um, like the the fact that the issue wasn't receiving attention is like, and, and then was closed is like that's an honest representation of where the where the where are people who are contributing to the project and where they're not. Um, so I think that uh, it, with respect to Stellbot and issues being closed or not, like let's say Stellbot didn't exist. I don't think that you would have been in any better shape because like, yeah, you would have searched for open issues and you would have been like, great, there's like 10,000 open issues, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Um, versus like, at least with Stalebot, it's like the open issues are the ones that have received activity in the last uh, five quarters. Um, so, you know, <laughs> there's a better chance that it's like on somebody's radar. Um, but like, I could definitely see differences of opinion on on all that stalebot stuff. I think the biggest problem is how do we um, raise visibility of issues that are important? Um, and I think usually it happens by like the squeaky wheel getting the oil, um, which also tends, which also will keep stalebot at bay, you know? Um, that's one of the reasons that like stalebot, like, yeah, like it posts on the issue and then you still got 90 days before it's gonna close it. If nobody's, if if nobody you know who was on the issue tracker including the original person pipes up and says like oh yeah i'm still hitting this or it still seems like a problem um then it's going to close it out i think yeah. uh yeah go ahead i, I was just going to say add to that matt i think that one of the things um that stalebot will probably change kind of our behavior is that if there are issues that you know somebody has filed but other people are hitting it that should drive kind of like which issues we need to go address. Now we still have to figure out how we, you know, go around addressing and making sure that they're there. But um, oftentimes like it might be an issue on a specific configuration. It's like, it can't be reproduced. And it's like, is this happening all the time? I don't really know. Like um, versus one that like 15 people have commented on and you're like, okay, that's the one that's going to be the priority. Uh, so maybe this kind of changes the way that we look at some of these bugs um, and force people to like, if you're hitting it, you know, make sure you're like adding more content or trying to like, you know, introduce like new, new information that might help um, the project kind of like address it sooner. That, that makes sense, George. It does seem to like have a single access of sort of popularity, whereas there's another access of severity. I agree. Um, where, you know, lots of people hitting some usability issues, say in a CLI, may attract a lot of comments, where a few people hitting data corruption may not. But kind of in terms of, I mean, even reputationally for OpenZFS as a project, like the latter may be more significant or maybe the harbinger of something more significant. Yeah, in Stillbot see. is supposed to um, not, uh, not, close or, or mention issues that have been marked like um, uh, like status, like type defect or something like that. So basically like if somebody has triaged it and, and been like, yep, that's a that's a defect, that's an actual problem, then I think still about leaves it alone or is supposed to, I think that may have been recently fixed. Um, so I think uh, we need a triage between platform Guys, because uh, one issue can be reproducible on one platform, but do not reproduce on another platform. Also, OpenZFS uh, ported some uh, features to Illumos 
and not features all features available on the Lumos right now, as I know. I have forged uh, much more features to DOS, the Lumos based distribution, but ZFS on Lumos and DOS are very different. Yeah, I mean, in terms of um, different platforms, you know, the the open ZFS GitHub issue tracker is like primarily for, you know, it's it's for all of the platforms that are supported by that code base. Yes. So, uh, you know, Linux and FreeBSD and, and maybe soon Mac OS. Um, for bugs that are encountered on other platforms, you know, they, they have their own issue trackers, but, um, you know, we, if it seems like it's something that would affect the common code base, then uh, for sure file those bugs against OpenZFS uh, GitHub as well. I tried to do it, but <laughs> I tried to open issues, what I found under my platform, at, and we tried to reproduce it on another, and take a look if it is reproducible, try to fix it. If not, Great. let me know that probably some platform specific issue or something else. Yeah, thanks for doing that. And Matt, what what is the triage process such as it is for in for new? Sorry, this the smirk, smirk coming up. Um, sorry, GitHub issue. No, no, no. I'm sorry for for asking a, a I guess stupid question. No, uh, it's no, uh, it's not a stupid question at all. I mean, I, I, as far as I know, the triage process is uh, essentially non-existent, and um, it's it's kind of. Uh, it should be specific. It's a volunteer basis, you know, um, in terms of issues. We, we've, we, I think that the the project resources, uh, such as they are, are um, are buried under PRs, and um, we're you know we're trying to focus on being responsive to PRs um, uh, in terms of like the the leadership, right, um, and and kind of who folks that we can ask to do stuff that uh, is not maybe what they would volunteer for. Um, and I think that the issue triaging is, is at this point a purely volunteer effort with little to no process that I'm aware of. So, so it's not, I mean, I get it. I get how, I understand why that would be the case, but it sounds like the priority is features that are driving the participants of the project and, and like the, the unfortunate, but sort of necessary work of, of bug fixing as it may not pertain directly to the products that folks are building, you know, falls to the, to uh, is more of a volunteer basis. Which yeah. I, mean, sense. I, I would, I would just qualify that slightly by saying that like it, it's not, you said like it's, it's the features that people care about that are getting, you know, attention from the project. And I would say, you know, it's, it's not just features. I mean, there's, there's plenty of PRs that are bug fixes um, and, you know, we for sure care about those getting those in, and those are oftentimes easier to get in than and that. That could be features. the trick of getting attention to your issue is create a PR for it with some <laughs> random incorrect fix and say, This needs a review. Okay, uh, thanks for that pro tip, that. Mark. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Well, I agree. I will sign those to you, Mark, and then you can um, <laughs> find, co you find code reviewers. That's right. You can code review those fixes into existence. Mark yeah. is now responsible for triage. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, I, I th thanks for answering the questions, Mark. So, I mean, uh, Matt sounds like and Mark sounds like there isn't any particularly concrete action here. Um, sounds like you are thinking about content for the developer summit. I don't know if there there might be something here, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, to to consider to present to the group, but. Just throwing it out there. Yeah, I mean, I hopefully I've like you know at least given information about the, the current state of the world. Um, I would love to see I would love to see more attention on bugs, um, and uh, I think that this is an area where the um, you know, the uh, volunteers could be very helpful uh, with in terms of triaging. Um, and, and raising the attention of these bugs, like the ones that you mentioned that slips through the cracks that do seem to be you know, very impactful, um, raising the attention of those to developers and other folks who can you know, take the next steps to actually investigate it. Because um, there is like a large volume of issues. I mean, there's 
just looking at now there's 872 issues open um you know even uh after stalebot has had its way that's right. um so you know that's like a lot of work to ask somebody who could otherwise be fixing bugs or or implementing new stuff to go spend like a week doing that um but it's something that you know people who want to contribute to the project who might not be like c coders um could really help out by looking at these issues and then raising you know raising attention to them making sure stalebot doesn't close them marking them and you know bringing them up at meetings like this well it's uh something we maybe have a small group do at the the hackathon is you know like we've done in FreeBSD 4 have a, a bug squash of just triage get a bunch of people go through look at it and especially if they can notice hey there's these four different bugs filed and it all looks to actually be the same crash uh so it's maybe it's more widespread than we think and we should aggregate in one issue and, and get attention to it and even maybe at the end of uh the hackathon their presentation is here's the five or ten bugs that we think are in most need of attention uh and can do that and yeah um that might help a couple of people get started with the process uh, and be comfortable with doing that on a more ongoing basis as volunteers to keep doing it. You know, when you're um, new, you kind yeah. of feel weird about doing it. That's a, terrific, that's a great idea, Alan, in terms of like, you know, people who are interested in doing something useful, giving them something very useful to do in concrete and like the, that they can make progress on and give them a little guidance on something that would have a big impact to the project. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Alan, is that something that you would be willing to lead at the hackathon? I was, I was trying to do, do that, that encrypted one. <laughs> you know, I, right. even just that's say, okay. You, don't, you setting, don't have to. Even setting the parameters of it would be really helpful. I think you don't have to yep. write the code, but even telling people, like, this is a great end state to get to in a day. It's like achievable, and that like you don't need to do it yourself. I don't think. Yep. But yeah. Uh, I think that's a, an interesting idea. You know, we've done a couple like that in FreeBSD, you know, the day before a conference, even just a bunch of developers, you know, you take the first 50 and the next 50 and just chunk it up. And then we presented the most interesting ones to each other and looked at, you know, are these some that we can maybe actually be able to get closed uh, or fixed or whatever. Although I think the outcome from the hackathon, if we picked out the ones we wanted to fix, it would be a bunch of the little UI things that don't matter and and the the nastier ones would get left in the pile. But just having a list of the, you know, out of the 800 here, the 10 that actually need the most attention would be a useful outcome. Or even doing the sort of deduping work of saying, hey, we've got these 20 bugs, but they all have very similar stack traces and it's worth at least, you know, guilty and proof, <laughs> until proven innocent. Yeah, and also just making sure the tagging is right. It looks like uh, the user who creates the the issue can put the type defect flag on it, and maybe there's some that shouldn't have that flag or whatever. But making sure they're flagged right so that the rules we have in the um, stale bot uh, apply correctly and so on. So I, I hear that instead of having a hackathon, it's called a bugathon. Yeah, and everybody tries to squad. fix as many bugs as they can at the end. You give points for how difficult the bug was that you fixed, and the winner has has fixed the more difficult bugs. Yeah, uh, that's a totally fair idea that that we make that the focus of the hackathon, and and maybe the, you know, I think traditionally we've had like three prizes. Maybe like two out of the three prizes go to um, bug work. Yeah. Um, I think. Uh... <laughs> Thank you, Adam. <laughs> for that reminder about hackathons in the chat. Um, uh, I think that the pro to be fair to the project and, and those contributing, I think that there has been uh, like, there is quite a bit of effort being spent on um, fixing bugs and, and addressing bugs, even those that maybe haven't been int introduced by the people doing that work. Um, but uh, like, it is not enough effort to keep up with the incoming rate um, and, and things have slipped through the cracks. Um, so, you know, I, I definitely appreciate the work that is being done um, while still acknowledging that like, it is not enough <laughs> to get us to where we want to be um, in terms of uh, both like most importantly, 
keeping bugs out of the system and and then also being responsive to uh, people who are filing bug who are doing the work to file bugs um, which is also necessary and appreciated yeah and and again uh, I really appreciate this discussion and, and hope that it didn't come across as accusatory and I also appreciate that the the values of the project um, are you know are aligned around this principle of quality yeah no thanks thanks a lot for bringing it up I think that um, I mean I, I've noticed all the same things that you have so uh, I, I appreciate like bringing it up and having the discussion. Well, and it sounds like I'm really encouraged that, that we even came up with some real actionable things, um, you know, bug fixing, some hackathon projects, and maybe some, you know, another hackathon project around new metrics to look at. Because uh, like the qualitative sense of like things maybe trending in the wrong direction, isn't that helpful, but like turning that into something you can measure, seems like it would be tremendously helpful. Yeah, it seems like one of those things that probably other people have um, invested in, like tools around GitHub to like measure, you know, bug rates, bug open close rates, um, categorization, like making some pretty graphs to kind of like take the tags and show us summaries of stuff. Um, that would be really cool if we could find those tools and apply them to our um, to our project. And uh, just to close out, since we're almost out of time, um, Adam, did uh, I know like you're mostly concerned about like the the big picture and the state of the project, but is this bug in particular um, one that you think we should uh, reopen? I didn't really have time to read over it um, during the meeting. Uh, Josh, do you have do you do you want to comment on that? Since you spent some time trying to reproduce it on our systems, uh, just to repeat the question: Should we re should we reopen this GitHub issue? Oh. I mean, I, I think reference feeling. It, is that the one with the similar stack? Yeah, yeah, the one yeah, that Alex I, had I, mentioned in that bug report. I think that's probably a good idea. I don't think it's fixed. It's pretty rare that. Um, I think that it requires importing an older ZFS stream that would require certain upgrades to occur. And then doing a bunch of clones concurrently, I think. Okay. It seems like without doing all of those things, it doesn't, at least it doesn't occur um, in a way that's noticeable. <laughs> it might still be happening, but uh, certainly no one has to pay for it uh, immediately unless you do, I think, several clones at once. There's some kind of uh, interaction in the arc quite right. So, uh, yes, I think it, it seems to be what's uh, reopening. Cool, thanks. And if you run into other bugs like that, then feel free to reopen them or ping me or ping folks on Slack. Yeah, I think Adam okay. found more than one uh, old bug that was very similar. I, I imagine this one might have got less attention because it was, this happens when I have a RAID Z1 with two dead drives uh, and the long story at the beginning, but uh, yeah. Cool. Um, well, thanks to everyone who participated. Um, the next meeting will be in four weeks. Um, October 12th, uh, is that right? Yes, October 12th um, at the later time, 1 p.m. Pacific. Uh, and I think that'll be the last meeting before the conference. Um, so that'll be exciting. Uh, and oh, and I found what the weird, what the fun music was that was playing. Um, someone had left Minecraft running in the background on my machine. Apparently it has like a really soothing soundtrack. <laughs> and the icon for it on the Mac at least is like, it, it's like a little terminal window or something, you know? So I, I was just like, oh, it's like one of the million terminal emulators running. Yes, Java, exactly. Um, so mystery solved. All right, thanks everyone. See you at the next meeting. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Thank you.